Lord is continuing to help me see into the word. And I thank God for it. I thank him for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's why I pray for myself constantly. And I pray for you as well. That God would give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of being in Christ. What it means to be in Christ. And, and, and how we are to live victoriously. Amen. Amen. And he's, he's been doing that. Amen. He's been doing it for me. That's my testimony. He's been doing it. And I, I just saw some more. This week, and uh, this will be a blessing to you. You know, I'll just let you know. I'm gonna. I probably mention a lot of scriptures. If I do, I I won't turn to each one of them because that's just not time for time's sake. I won't turn to each one of them. But if I do mention them and get the reference, you might want to write them down. But don't try to keep up and turn to them. You know, because we won't be turning to each one of them. But uh, but we will turn to the first one. Is John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 16. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Verse 16. This is uh in uh, this is actually the Lord's Prayer, uh, the disciples' prayer. But uh, part of that is in I'll start reading in verse uh, 16. Says, they are not of this world, speaking about his disciples, and you and me. They are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I'll start reading in verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the word, world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Amen. And we discussed this scripture before uh, where Jesus said, they are not of this world. They are not of this world. And he's speaking about you and me. Amen. And the uh, message translation of that verse, verse 16 in the message translation says, they are no more defined by this world than I am defined by this world. That's what Jesus is saying about his disciples, you and me, amen, believers. He said, you are not defined by this world any more than I am defined by this world. And that word defined means marked by its boundaries and limits. Hear that? Marked by its boundaries and limits. So Jesus is saying about his disciples, he was saying, first of all, by himself, he said, I'm not marked by this by the boundaries and limits of the world. The world doesn't dictate to me and determine to me my boundaries and my limits. But Jesus also said about his disciples, about us. He said, the world doesn't determine your boundaries or your limits any more than it does mine. That's what Jesus said. He's pretty bold to say it. He said it, and it's a big statement, and it's a bold statement, and Jesus lived that out. He didn't let the world dictate to him any limitations or any boundaries. Amen? It was not dictated by the world. He lived above it, and he lived victoriously, and he overcame, and he expects us to do the same thing as well. Amen? Because he said, you're not limited by the world either, any more than I am. Amen? He didn't just say that statement. He actually repeated it. He said it twice. He said it once in verse 14. He says that... Uh, I am not of this world, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. And he said it again in verse 16, they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. So if Jesus says anything, you know it's important, right? Everything the master said is important. But if he repeats something, he's shouting it. He's really emphasizing that the fact that we need, we need to realize that, that we're not limited and bound by the world and what the world wants to put on you by how the world wants to keep you in its limits and, and, and boundaries. Amen? Amen. And so I was thinking about that, and I was meditating about that, and I began to ask myself, okay, Lord, why? Why, are you, why were you so bold to make that statement? That we, Because I've been on this, I've been having something go over my heart for the last, for months and months, and actually for even longer than that, but I've been meditating about it strong, about limitations. 
I don't want to live in any limitations. I want a limitless life. Jesus lived a limitless life. Nothing moved him. Nothing stopped him. Nothing controlled him. Amen. He was beyond limits, beyond man's limits, beyond the world's limits. Amen. And he said right here that we can live and we are to live the same way. Amen. But I, and he said that we're not, we're not defined by this world system. But I began to ask myself, why? Why was Jesus so certain to say that? And this teaching is just uh, three points that I'm going to give to you. Three points that are to answer that. Three reasons why you're not bound to this world. You're not limited. There's nothing that the world can throw at you. Nothing the devil can throw at you that can limit you and stop you and can tell you nothing through the curse that he does that might impact and does impact the whole world, but it doesn't and shouldn't impact us any more than it impacted Jesus. Jesus lived above it. In fact, he freed people from those, those bounds and limitations that they were under. Amen? So, But this is the three things the Lord dropped in my heart just to share that are the three reasons why Jesus made that statement and why Jesus could make that statement. And, and uh, the first place I'll turn to is the first in the same gospel, the gospel of John. Let's turn back to John chapter 1. Why are we not limited by this world system any more than Jesus was? You know? Why are we not bound to its limitations and its boundaries? And God expects for us to live that way. Amen? Amen? Sadly, many of us don't. Sadly, most believers just live on the same level as the world does. The only difference is that they've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and when they die, they'll go to heaven. But the world, they'll die, and they won't, they don't, if they die outside of Christ, they won't. And that's not God's intention. He doesn't intend for you and me to live exactly like the world lives. He intends for you to stick out and to and to show out and to stick out as being a believer that I'm different. There's something different about me and that we're not, we're not in the same boat. Someone said, we're all in the same boat. I'm not in the same boat. Amen. We might come across the same storms that the world does, but we're not in the same boat. We're in Jesus' boat, amen? Yes, and we're believers. and we should, we should, this, Our life should be, have a marked difference. But there's too many believers that I do know, and I'm sure you know, that are just as worried as the world is, just as full of fear, anxiety, stress, just as burdened down, just as beat down by life as the world is, as, as anybody in the world. In fact, there are people in the world you can look to that are happier many times than many believers that you know. I know people who are unsaved that are happier, more content, more satisfied in life than many believers that you know. And that's not how God intended for you to live. That's not how, and that's not how we're going to live. I mean, we're going to live. If Jesus said it's possible, and he said he expects us not to be bound, then we're going to press and find out, and we're going to do this. Amen? And the number one reason, first, and I'm looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And I'll start reading in, <clears throat> I'll start reading in verse 1. I was reading, I mean, the verse I want to get to is verse 5, but might as well start in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Look at verse 3. And it says, in him was life. In him. Who's him? It was speaking about Jesus, right? Jesus, the word. In him was what? Life. That word life is the word zoe. In him was zoe. Life, that's the life in the nature of God. That's the unique life that only God possesses. No one possesses this life but God. Angels don't have it. Animals don't have it. Plants don't have it. They all have life, but no one possesses this unique life but God. It's his unique life. Separates him from everyone and everything else. Amen? And in him, in Jesus was the, uh, was this life. And the life was the light of men. I, it's interesting that word the appears in front of that word life the second time. Same word, same word, Zoe. But you know, many times it doesn't come out so much in the King James, but many times, most times in the Greek, it is the word the life. In him was the life. 
this, this, this unique Zoe life. And the life was the light of men. Notice verse 5. It says, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Hear that? That the light that, that came from this life, that the life of God, this unique life that God has, that light shines in darkness, and the Bible says the darkness comprehended it not. That word comprehended right there, look at that word comprehended. It's, it's unfortunate that translation came out in the King James. Very unfortunate, because when we say compre to comprehend, we think of that word means to understand. Darkness could not understand the light. That's not what it means. That is not at all what it means. That word uh, uh, comprehended right there is from a Greek word, katalambano. It's a compound word, katalambano. Two words put together to make one. The word kata, K-A-T-A, it speaks of the force that is uh, speaks of a force that is dominating something or controlling something. This is so important. He said that light shined in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not, or the darkness could not catalambano. It could not uh, uh, exert a force that would dominate and control it. That word lambano means to seize or to grab hold of it. So to seize or to grab hold of something. So uh, put those two words together, catalabano, it means, it means that when it says that the light, that that darkness could not uh, comprehend or could not catalabano the light, it means it could not seize it, pull it down, conquer it, or hold it in its power or control. It was not, it was, uh, it was not, uh, able to hold the light under its domain. Jesus walked in that life, right? Jesus possessed that life and that light. And he says, darkness. What is darkness? Darkness is the devil, right? Darkness is demons, right? Darkness is anything the devil and demons bring, like the curse, fear, sickness and disease, poverty, worry, stress, anxiety, all, all the things that sickness, lack, all those things that, that are a result of Satan's union with man and when and Adam sinned, that is all um, under the word darkness. Amen? But the Bible says that darkness, all that was about darkness, could not seize Jesus and hold him. It could not contain him. It couldn't dominate him. It couldn't control him. It couldn't pull him down and conquer and hold, it, un, hold him under his power. Not that darkness didn't try. Darkness tried numerous times throughout his whole life. Like darkness attempts to do that to every man, any man that walks this earth ever since Adam sinned. But Jesus, because of what? Well, because he's God. No. He is God. He is God was God, always will be God, but the Bible says it's because he had the life. He possessed this life, and because he possessed this life, Satan couldn't, couldn't dominate him, couldn't control him. He couldn't seize him and take him and, and have him under his control. And anything that Satan tried, he could not do it to Jesus. Once, no, and once again, not that he wouldn't try. He tried numerous times throughout Jesus' life, but he could not. He didn't say he did not. He said he could not. By the very nature of life itself, by the very nature of God's life, God's unique life, God is not dominated by anyone. He's almighty. Amen? Amen? But Jesus possessed this life. And because of this life, which was the light of men, gee, that's, what he, that's why darkness could not catalambano. It could not control it in any way, shape, or form. Amen? Amen? The only time, the only time that darkness did catalambano, Jesus. The only time that darkness did take Satan, Satan did take Jesus in his control, seize him and take him his control and bring him under his dominion was in the garden, beginning in the garden and going on to the whipping post and going on to the cross where Jesus became sin and offering for sin and he died and he went to the pit for three days and three nights and that was the first time that darkness had ever 
seized and got control. But guess what? That was by God's design. And Satan didn't know that because the Bible says, had the princes of this world known, Satan had tried his whole life to get control of Jesus. He had tried his whole life to bring him under his subjection through the curse, through sickness, through disease, through, through uh, uh, violence, trying to get him killed, storms, trying to kill him through storms, trying to kill him by people stoning him, by the different things. He had tried numerous times and Jesus always dominated. Why? Why? Because he's the son of God. He's God. Once again, he is God. But he didn't walk among us as God. He walked among us as a man with Zoe, as a man with the life, a man with the life. And a man with the life, Jesus, the Bible says, he could not be dominated. He could not be dominated, amen? And once again, the only time Jesus, Satan did do that was at the cross, death, burial, resurrection, three days, three nights. But on that third day, Jesus was raised again unto what? Eternal life. Zoe was once again reunited. Jesus was once again united with Zoe. And when he was, when he was, that's when he spoiled principalities and powers, made an open show of him, triumphed over Satan, triumphed over darkness, triumphed over everything that Satan could bring. Jesus triumphed over it and rose victorious. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. What's that got to do with me? What's that got to do with you? I'm answering the question why Jesus said that the world cannot put me, he can, that the world cannot control me and limit me, and it can't limit you any more than it limits me. Why? Number one, because of that life. Amen. That life. That life that in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy but I am come, Jesus said, that you might have, the Greek, the Greek says, the life. You might have that life. What life, pastor? That life that here it says that darkness could not catalabano. Darkness could not hold it, could not contain it, could not keep it down, couldn't seize it. Couldn't, nothing Satan can do with that. You, I've come, Jesus said. He said the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the devil. That's what the devil does. When he when he Lombard, something, he uses the sick. He uses a, a stealing, killing, and destroying. That's all he has. But Jesus said, if I can get you this one thing, you don't got to worry about that. You will you will never be dominated. You will never have to worry about. You will never have to worry about Satan having you in his control and holding you down and keeping you down and limiting you in any way any more than it did me. That's whatever he offers. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So John 10.10 10 says, I've come, Jesus said, that you might have the life, that unique life, that Zoe life, that life that darkness cannot comprehend, that darkness cannot, cannot control. And 1 John 5.12 says, he that hath the Son hath the life. Amen. How many folks have the Son? Jesus said, you have, if you have the Son, then guess what? You have what I had that enabled me to, to, to not be able to be controlled and dominated by Satan or the curse. Amen? You, Jesus wasn't operating in the earth as God. That's so important. If you don't get that, you, 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 you'll never, ever, ever rise to live like you're supposed to live unless you understand the kenosis of Jesus, the self-emptying of Jesus. Though he was God, he emptied himself of his divine privileges, Paul said, and walked among them as a servant of God, as a servant. Amen? Amen? Let this mind be in you, I'm, I'm quoting what Paul said, let this mind be in you who is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself. That's the word kenosis in the Greek. To empty himself of his divine privileges. He said, I'm not going to walk among us. I could do it as God, of course. Of course God could come down and slap the devil around and kick his butt and beat him and, and do whatever he wanted to. Of course God could do that. But could a man with life do it? Jesus proved it, yes. And he said, I've come that you might have an exact life, and he that has the Son has an exact life. That's why when Jesus was in the world, it, what was that life? That life was the light of men. That's why when Jesus was in the earth, he said, well, I'm in the earth, I'm the light of the world. 
Remember Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But then a few, a little, little while later, before he was about to go to the cross, what did he say to his disciples? Now you are the light of the world. You are the light. He didn't say you are a light. Don't weaken this and water this down with your little weak, broke down songs of this little light of mine. You know, no, you're not a light. You are the light. Jesus was the light to the world. And darkness could not comprehend it. Darkness couldn't, couldn't overwhelm it, couldn't overtake it, couldn't control it in any way. And now he says, you're the light of the world, just like I am. You're not a light in the world. Well, Jesus is the big light, and we're the little lights. No, you're the light, just like he was the light. What makes you the light? Life. That life was the light of men. When you are the light of the world. That's what Jesus is saying. Just like on the same level that I was. He didn't give you a measure of life. He didn't give you a measure of life. John 10, 10 says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The Amplifier says, that you might have it to the fullest measure. Till it overflows. To the full. I've given you the, I've given you the light. Therefore, you are the light. Of the world now. Glory to God. That's what Jesus is saying. That's why the world can't control you. The devil through his through the world system, you're not limited like the world. You're not in the same boat, the same things that keep the world down and keep the devil's crowd down through his curse and, and poverty. God said, Jesus said, You're not, that's not about you. That's not you. That that wasn't me. It couldn't do it for me, they can't do it for you. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. If. I will add this one thing. If. If, number one, you have to be aware of the fact that you possess the life. If you're not aware of it, guess what? It won't do much for you. That's anything that God gives you. Unless you know. That's why John said, I've written unto you that you may know that you have, John said, the life. The life. Yeah. What life? That same life that, 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 that the devil could not overwhelm, overcome to whatever he tried. That's the same John that went down in the oil and, and, and boiling oil. They tried to kill him more than once. And once they boiled him in oil and he came back up and was like, okay, and, and, and walked away, bless God. Why? What was, well, that was the miracle that God did. Because, no, that was John because he was aware of the life. The life in this life, this life can't be compromised with death any more than they can pick up stones and kill Jesus. They couldn't do it. They tried more than once, tried to push him off a cliff. And they said, no, he, he's walked away. He just walked away. John just walked away. Paul was stoned and he just got up, brushed himself off and walked away. Amen. Why? Because of the life, this life. Amen. 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 But you have to, number one, you have to walk. You have to be aware of it and then you have to walk in it. Just be aware of it and walk it. And the problem is that we haven't been aware of it. We've been told things like, well, you're, just, you're only human. I'm only human, right, Pastor? We're all human. God knows we're just human. <laughs> we're just human. God said, no, I'm like, who are you talking about? I, I never said that. I said, you're God's. I know. I ain't got time to go into that, but I should have just. Anyway, no, you're not only human. Just, you are, we said last week, you are of God, we said, proceeding forth from, having its origin in. You came forth from God. His very nature, his very essence, his very DNA is, is, is in part, is, is in you. Amen. What does that make you? What does that make you? Does that make you only human? No. Paul said, we're not mere men. We do not live as mere men. Jesus did not live as a mere man. Mere men are dominated by Satan and by the curse and by darkness all the time. But Jesus with the life is not. And any believer who, has, who is aware of the fact that you have the life and you know how to walk in it, Satan knows it. I, I, he, he can't. No, he can't. He can, nothing he can do about you. I, I, saw, I saw on sports the other day, I was watching sports, and this is one, I don't know who the player was, and he's a real good basketball player, uh, and they were asking him, they were asking the coach before the game, the, op, the opposing coach, how are you going to stop this guy when, he, when you play him? How, when your team plays this, this team with this guy on, how do you stop him? And this is what he said. He said, we can't stop him. 
we can just try to contain him, but we can't stop. We can hear that. We can, all we can do is try to contain him. This man's averaging, well, if, he's, if he's averaging like 25, 30 points a game, maybe if we can contain him, maybe he might just get 10 or 15 or 20 uh, on us. I don't know. But we can't stop him. But we can, That's how the devil looks at you. I know I can't stop her. I know I can't stop him. And with the life that they have, that they've been given, Jesus said, I've come that you might have it. And you've been given it. He that has the son have life. The devil knows I can't stop you. But if I can keep you in ignorance, I'll contain you. And that's his plan is to contain you. To contain you on the level of the world until you go to heaven. Then it don't matter anymore. You know what I'm saying? Heaven's not the end. The end. And for us, I mean, that, that's, not the, that's not where we're, we're at. We're after it in this life. We're after it in this world right now. That's what Jesus wants and needs is for someone to shine as the light in this world. And you are the light. Why are you the light? Because you have the life. Amen. It doesn't matter where you go. If you walk into a room, the Holy Ghost told me. Chris, this woman told me this. If you walk into a room and you're the only believer in that room, nobody else is a believer in that room, guess who just walked in? God just walked in. The answer just walked in. The light just walked in. He's, 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 he's got Chris, if you step into a city and nobody in that city is saved, and all the thousands of people in that city are unsaved. They're heathens. They're devil worshipers and heathens. Fool the devil. When you walk into that city, the answer just walked in. The light just walked in. The life just walked in. You're the light of the world. You're the light of that city. You're the, you're the light. You're the body of Christ in that city. You're the life in that city. And he said, hey, Chris, if you walk into a country, the same thing, and you're the only one in that country that knows Jesus, and you're the only one that, guess what? You're not at a disadvantage. You have the life. You have the life. And he said, if you walk onto a continent, and on that continent is Billions of people that, and none of them are saved. When you walked onto that continent, when you stepped on that continent, the, the highest ranking authority in heaven and in earth just walked onto that continent. You, you, God in you has just walked in that continent. And the devil knows it. The devil knows it. Amen? Amen. Amen. But if you don't know it. If, you're not, if you think that, well, what can I do? I'm just one little person. This little light of mine. Oh, God, help us. It's time to grow up. It's time to realize what God has imparted to us. And that's the number one reason. That's the, that's the first reason the Lord gave me. It's because it's the reason why the devil cannot limit you. The devil through the curse cannot hold you down. Nothing, he can, anything that's negative. And you might be in a situation right now where you have been pushed down and pushed back and held down. It's only temporary. You keep walking, you keep walking in the life. You keep realizing, recognizing who you are in Christ Jesus. It's only temporary. You're coming up and you're coming out of it. You're coming up and you're coming out of it victoriously. You'll have a testimony. It's a test now, but it's about to be a testimony, bless God, of the life of God and what the life of God can do in an individual. Amen. That's what Jesus lived. Glory to God. Amen. The second reason. The second reason why the Lord just showed me that the reason why that, uh, that, that, that the world, that, that, that the devil, darkness cannot catalapano. The darkness cannot comprehend you. The darkness cannot stop you. It's because of the life, and you're the light and the life. But the, and, and, and the more, what also... But Jesus was expecting that you will live in this earth without limits. Amen. What would it look like without limits? I guess it would look like Jesus. Yeah? It would look like Jesus. But I expect Jesus said to have a whole bunch of me walking around acting just like Jesus did. Amen. Where the devil couldn't control. The devil, the devil would lose control when this one Jesus came, I, this is one of my favorites, when Jesus came to the coast of the Gadarenes, those madmen of Gadar, that madmen of Gadar, that those demons, the legion of demons, that were, they were dominating that whole region. It was locked up and dominated by the, that, that, that demons possessed man. A legion of demons in one man. And there was nothing they could do about it. They were all afraid, they were all hiding, they were all just, and he was just controlling that whole demon until one man walked on the coast. Jesus got off the boat. And when Jesus got off the boat, the light, the light showed up. The life showed up. 
Amen? And things were about to change. And that's the same thing with you and me in this generation. It's dark. Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's full of demons. Yes, there's full of the demonic influence. There's bad things happening. But God said, I'm looking for somebody to rise up and realize that you are the light. Because you possess the life. And you go and you're the answer to that region. You, the life of God in you is the answer to that region. Amen. And nothing the devil can do to stop you. Amen? Amen? Number two, and the second reason why. Number one is because you have the life. Number two is you have the word. You have the word of God. As simple as that. I know it sounds simple, but it's, it's that simple. You have the word. The same weapon that Jesus used. Jesus didn't use anything that, was, that, that is not possessed by you to whip the devil. He didn't come in this earth and, and take on the devil up and down the shores of Galilee and win on every, and dominate, completely live above the norm, live out of every limit and boundary. He didn't do that because, he didn't do that because he was God. He did it because he was a man, number one, with life, a man, number two, who lived by the word. He walked on the word and lived by the word his whole life. When Jesus is first, of course, as a baby in the manger, it's not mentioned, but as a 12-year-old boy, we hear Jesus. What's Jesus doing? Talking the word with the, with the scribes, or not scribes, but with the religious, you know, uh, the, the teachers of the law, teachers of the word, doctors of the word. They're, he's, he's discussing the word. He's discussing the word. He's living by the word, living by the word. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, how did he begin it? He stood up. In the synagogue to read, the Bible says he found the place in the book. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, or the recovering of sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He sat down and said, This day is this scripture fulfilled. He found himself in the word. That's, how, that's why Jesus was victorious. He found himself in the word. You need to find yourself in the word. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about those in Christ scriptures, talking about who we are in Christ, in him, in whom, in the beloved. Those, those, those phrases, those phrase, uh, a preposition in those phrases appear throughout the New Testament, but every one of them talks about who you are. It's talking about you. That's why just like Jesus found himself in the word and he said, hey, that's me. You need to find yourself in the word and say, hey, that's me. When it says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus, you can say, hey, that's me right there. Yes. When it says, I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. Hey, that's me. That's me. Greater is he that is in me than he that, hey, that's me. I'm the greater, the greater, the greater one's living in me, bless God. Amen? Amen. Amen. You need to find yourself in the word. Find yourself in the word and live like Jesus. That's why Jesus lived victoriously. That's why Jesus, that's why Jesus overcame temptation on the Mount of Temptation. What did Jesus do? He didn't use any magical powers from heaven that who washes, razzle dazzle the dead. No! He opened, he opened his mouth and he spoke. The word, it is written. It is written. It is written. Amen? That third time he said, it was said unto me. That's what, that's what God did. It says two times Jesus quoted the scripture. But that third time he said, it has been said unto me. That means God dropped a rhema word right there in his heart. From the scripture that Jesus knew, dropped it in his heart. And that was the one that backed the devil off that mountain. And the Bible says, the devil leaveth him. Why? Because of the word. I'm living by the word. That's why Jesus was victorious. That's why he overcame. You know what Jesus said one, one time? I was meditating on a scripture in John chapter 8, verse 32, where it says, you should know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Remember that scripture? Now, now, we have to keep that whole thing in context. People quote part of the scripture. They say, well, you know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth will set you free, Pastor, right? No, 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 no the truth won't set you free. Not what Jesus said. He was talking to some, he's talking to some people there, and the Bible says many people believed on him as he was preaching. Many believed on him as he was preaching that day. And he said to them, continue ye in my word. Continue ye in my word. That word continue means to abide. Abide in the word. 
Then shall you be my disciples indeed. Then you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And what he was saying, what he was, and it dawned on me, what he was saying was, look at me, I'm free. I'm free from everything. I'm free from bondage. I'm free from fear. I'm free from sickness and disease. I'm free from poverty. I'm free. I'm free. And he's telling them the answer, how, they, how they get free. He said, you continue in my word. Abide in my word. He didn't say, well, you got to do this and do that and do the other and become. Be, no, just abide in my word. Then you'll be a, my disciple. That word disciple it means a learner. You'll be a learner. And you'll know the truth. And it's the truth that you learn will make you free just like me. You'll be just like me. Then he pointed to the religious rulers and said, they're not free. They're slaves. And they said, we've never been in bondage to anybody. Yes, you are. You're slaves to Satan. He said, but I'm not. I'm free. Why am I free? Well, because he's God. and he's never... No, he's free because the word made him free. The word kept him free. Kept him free from sin, kept him free from temptations, tests, and trials, kept him free from all the things that subdue and hold back and hold down and limit people of the world. The, the word kept him free. You hear the good news? Jesus said, you can be free just like me. You can be just as free as me. But it doesn't come any other way. It comes by learning my word. And it, it, it reminds me of something else he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Yeah. But he didn't stop there. He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You know what that word learn right there means? It's the exact same Greek word as disciple. He said, Take my yoke upon you, be my disciple, be the learner. Then you, then, he said, then you'll find rest in your souls. He said, my yoke is easy. You'll find that my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You'll find rest in your souls when you learn of me. It's, it's, it's not, I can't snap my fingers. Listen, I was in a church one time. I was visiting a church. Let me give you an example. I was visiting a church, and this church, at, at this particular, particular time, I was a, a minister guest there at the church, and uh, there was just a spirit of oppression at that church. It is just so sad. You could tell it in the... Even as they were singing praise and worship, they were singing, but it was a spirit of oppression there where people had been just beat up. They'd been going through some stuff. Trials and tests, and some were sick, and some were, uh, had family issues. And they had used to tell that the devil just was having a heyday at that church. And this is what the pastor did. The pastor got up and he said, he apparently sensed it, and he got up and he said, I want you all to come up. I want you, if anybody in this room is burdened down, and beat down and oppressed or going through a situation and you're about to the end of your rope and you, I want you to come up front, we're going to lay hands on you. I'm going to lay hands on you and when I lay hands on you, you're going to be set free. And we're going to believe God for you to be set free. And he did. And it bothered me a lot. It bothered me a lot. I'm not against laying on hands. I'm not against it. He don't say that Pastor Chris said laying on the hands doesn't work and it's not any good. Yes, we should be laying hands on people to impart blessing and healing. I'm not against prayer. Don't say that Pastor Chris said we shouldn't be praying. But Jesus in John 8.32, if Jesus can lay hands on those people and make them free, why did Jesus say continue in my word? He, he, didn't, he, he, he didn't say... he. he didn't, it, it, the Bible says they believed on him. They were believers, but yet, yet they were, had problems there. He said, continue in my word. Then you'll be a learner, and learners will be free. If Jesus, if anyone can lay hands on, the, on somebody and just make them free from oppression, worry, stress, anxiety, depression, suicidal, if anyone can lay hands on them and get them free, who, who could do that? Jesus could. You would think Jesus is good. Why didn't Jesus just line those people up and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just lay hands on everyone here, and when I lay hands on you, the anointing on me is going to come on you, and you'll be free. And so here we go. Free, 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 free. All you free, free. He didn't do that. He said, continue ye in my word, and you'll be a learner, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free just like me. In other words, he could have laid hands on. I, I'm going I'm to combine this illustration with another one I heard from Kenneth E. Hagan. Kenneth E. Hagan, you know, he had a great healing ministry, 
But he also had a great deliverance ministry, anointing and deliverance. That people who were bound by demons, he, he, could, he could know it by certain sensations that he would have in his hands if a demon was present and he could cast the demon out of people. And he talked about believers. Now, Kenneth Hagin ministered. He's in heaven now. But he had ministered for decades, over 60 years, in this anointing. And he said, this is what I found. He said, over, well over 90-something, 90 95, 90, most, most believers, believers we're talking about, do not need me to lay hands on them to get free. He said, they do not need it. He said, I, I've done it. I do it. And... He said, but believers don't, he said 95 or whatever percent don't even need me to lay hands on them. Every once in a while someone has a, but most of all, he's talking about addictions, alcoholic, pornographic addictions, just all kinds of, 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 of worries, suicidal, just different, different types of, of things that Satan uses to oppress people. He said, believers don't need that. He said, if they would just get into the word. He said, 95% of them, the demons would just leave. <laughs> just because you got into the word. You know why? Because the word is anointed. And he said, and he said, but if I do lay hands on them, if I do lay hands on them and get them free, if they don't get into the word then, it's coming back. That, that oppression is coming back. Because... Nowhere in the New Testament does it say they shall lay hands and cast out something and make you free. But the master, Jesus said, continue in my word, become a learner, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus, the master, said, take my yoke upon you and learn. Become a learner. Then, then you'll find rest unto your souls. You're not going to get away from it. You can't get around it. You're not going to live victoriously apart from the word. Amen? So you might as well get into the word. Now, if you need some help, well, yeah, I believe in praying for people. I can lay hands on you. But at some point in time, victory comes. Jesus walked in victory because he walked in what? In the word. Jesus was an overcomer because he walked in the word. He just walked in the word. He, and he, all he had was the Old Testament. But he lived and walked in, in the Old Testament. 2 Peter 1 and 4 says, I'm going to turn there. 2 Peter 1 and 4. Oh, that's, that's cool. That. I won't turn there. He says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious, what? Promises. The word. What God gave what? The word. That by these ye might be partakers of, of the divine nature. Pastor Chris, I thought that I was already partaker of the divine nature, Zoe. Yeah, you know, you're a possessor of it. Partakers are different. You possess it when you were born again. You possess life, the life, but you partake of it when you begin to walk in it. How do you walk in it? Whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, 2 Peter 1.4, that by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. That means when the devil tries to hold you down and the devil tries to limit you and keep you under, you standing on the promises of God, finding a promise of God and standing on that promise is what will make you come out victoriously. Amen? And this was, we can follow this throughout all Jesus' life, even to the very cross itself. When Jesus was hung on the cross, he was quoting, speaking the word. And we have the psalm that, that David spoke, that Jesus went into the pit of hell and stood, if I had time to teach you, Jesus in the pit of hell on that third, he was standing on the word of God. You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. David spoke that, but he was speaking that about the master. And that's the scripture that Jesus held on to in that pit. We were being pulverized under Satan's control for those three days and three nights pulverized by demons. He was holding on to that scripture, and guess what? He came out of that dark place. He came out victoriously. There came a rising to the master, and there'll come a rising to you. 
Hold on to the word of God. That's what Jesus did from the very beginning to the very end. And even in the pit, he held on to the word of God. And he came out on top of every situation. And so will you. It's not hard. It's not. But you can't get around it. But don't, don't go away and say, well, Pastor Chris said, there ain't no use of praying for nobody laying hands on folks. Oh, yeah, we lay hands on folks. Cast the devil out of them. Help them and lay hands on them, pray for them, do whatever you say. But at the same time, you got to get the word into them. If, when the word comes, the word's already anointed. The word's already anointed. And Jesus said, it'll make you free just like me, he said. It'll make you just as free as me. I'm free. I'm not free because I'm the son of God. I'm free because I walk in the word. I'm not provided for. And, and I don't live in victory, victory in every situation just because I'm God's son. I live in victory because I walk by the word. Glory to God. Remember when Brother Copen? Brother Copen tells a story, Brother Pastor. I too, he, I'm sure you told this story. When Brother Copen was first saved, he still smoked cigarettes. He smoked a lot of cigarettes. And he couldn't drop. He couldn't break that cigarette habit. And he was and so he, he couldn't break it. He felt bad about it. And you know, cigarettes is not going to keep not going to make you go to hell. Don't let anyone tell you that if you smoke cigarettes, you're going to go to hell. That's ridiculous. The problem is with smoking cigarettes is you're going to go to heaven faster than what you should. <laughs> Because cigarettes kill people. That's the reason why you shouldn't smoke. It's ridiculous to smoke. You shouldn't do it because it's going to kill you, man. You're going to go to heaven, and you still got an assignment here on the earth. But Brother Copeland was still smoking. And he said he was embarrassed by it, smelling like smoke and this and that. But he went to a, a meeting at Hilton Sutton's church. And they invited him. Someone invited him to a meeting at Hilton Sutton's church. And they invited him in there. And he ended up minister. He ended up actually, he was a young minister, but he wasn't actually in the ministry yet, but he could sing. And they asked him to sing. And so he sang with them and sat under the word. And this meeting lasted for a couple weeks. And he said the meeting lasted for a couple weeks and the word was just so rich. They were preaching and teaching the word. It was so rich. And he said that when he was so, he was about ready to leave the meeting. And he got into his car and he was about to drive off. And the visor, he kept his cigarettes in the, in the visor above his head. And the cigarettes, and it, and he opened the visor and the visor, the cigarettes just fell down. And they were all dried up and cigarettes that were all dried up because he hadn't smoked them. And he realized, I'm free. I, I didn't try to get delivered from cigarettes. I've been praying and crying and begging God to get me free. He said, but something happened in those two weeks. What happened? He said, I got into the word of God. I was just in the atmosphere of the word of God. And it was so rich. And somehow during that during that meeting, I got free. I didn't know. I, I didn't know it. I just got free. I took those cigarettes. I just threw them off the door and it just kept on going. Never smoked a cigarette since then. All the praying, all the crying, all the begging that he was going to by God. Believers don't need that stuff. Believers need to walk in the Word, and you realize that the Word is what makes you free. And the Word already, He's already free. Amen. And so are you. And I've had that, and I'm not going to go to, I've had that happen to me in this, in the not, and I say I've never smoked cigarettes like that, but in other areas where, yeah, struggling with your mental things, sorry, with your mental man or, or, or attitudes or this and that, and, or things with the flesh, struggling with habits. And, and I never tried to get rid of the habit. I, pray, I used to try and cry and struggle with it, but somehow it happened when I began to captivate, get captivated by the Word of God. A lot of things is when, when did I get when did I stop doing that? I don't know. I just stopped. Amen. Why the word? The word's anointed. Amen. And that's what and Jesus once again. But I'm answering the question: Why is it that the devil cannot, darkness cannot contain you any more than it can contain Jesus? Darkness cannot. Why is it? Why is it that I'm just as unlimited as Jesus is? Well, number one, I had the same life that he did. That he does, I possess. I'm a, I have. I have his life. Amen. And number two, I have his word. Amen. And number three, this is this will be the last one. We, I'll, I'll hit this one real quick. This is the third reason why. And the third reason why that Jesus expects you to live limitless above everything, just like he did. Jesus said this after his death and resurrection. He said, "Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you." Hmm. Remember that. This is after he's resurrected, he's talking to his disciples, and he said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, he said. 
Amen. He said, he told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. Endued. That word endued means to be clothed. In fact, it was translated uh, clothed elsewhere, to be clothed with, to be endued with power. So God's, Jesus said, I'm going to put some on you. He said, he told his disciples, they were already saved. They were already called. They were already, he said, don't go nowhere until I put some on you. I'm going to put some on you. I'm going to, I'm going to send the promise of the Father upon you. I'm going to clothe you with something. You shall receive power, he said, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Upon you. Amen? Amen. 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 Remember that word dudamus. That's where we get that word power. You should receive power. That's what, that's what Jesus received on that when he was baptized in the Jordan and the Holy Ghost descended upon him like a dove. What did he got? He got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Changed everything. Explo that, that word dunamis, it, it is we, we always talk about dynamite because it is the word that is translated, that we get the word dynamite from. It means explosive power, something explosive. But that word dunamis is also uh, the word that they used to express or to describe the, four, the full force, the full might of the Roman army was the Roman army's dunamis. That was their dunamis. It spoke, speaks of the might of the Roman army. The Roman army at the time was the mightiest army on the planet by far. And their dunamis was, it was spoken of their, their, their power, was their dunamis, their might. Amen. That word dunamis was also used to describe acts of nature like a hurricane or like a tornado. Things that man cannot contain, that man cannot hold back and, and do it. There's nothing pe people can do about hurricanes these days as far as all you can do is batten them down, batten down or hold down and hope that, you know, pray. You know, we believers can, but, you know, for the most part, uh, a force of nature cannot be stopped. Amen? Well, that's what Jesus said you become like when you receive the exact same Holy Spirit endowment that I received. Jesus said you become just like me. Would you say that Jesus was a force of nature? I would. When Jesus came, he was a force of nature. Would you say that Jesus was like a one-man army? I would. Jesus was like a one-man army. Why? Not, not because he was God, but he was a one-man army because the Holy Ghost came upon him. Amen? Amen. And, and, and I will also say that Jesus was like a bomb, a, 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 a Holy Ghost atomic bomb going somewhere to explode. Amen? I would say that too. Amen? Well, guess what Jesus said? That same exact spirit, that same exact resurrection power that came upon Jesus, that quickened him, made, that, that first of all, that, that empowered him in the earth, but that, that quickened him and made him, is the same Holy Ghost that came upon you. Amen? When you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? Jesus said, you don't have anything I don't have. It wasn't by anything that, I just, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen? And Paul said that, that it's that same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead. If he dwells in you, he'll quicken. That's what he does. He's already defeated death. That Holy Ghost has already seen death at its worst. That was the same Holy Ghost that went into the earth, that caught hold of Jesus, that raised him from the dead in the first place. Same Holy Ghost. So he's already seen the worst that death and fear and, and the devil and darkness can produce. And he's already overcome it on Jesus. But guess what? It's the same spirit in you. You didn't receive a different spirit. You didn't receive, you didn't receive a different level of Holy Spirit. Like Jesus received a super duper anointing of the Holy Spirit, but you received a little touch. No, no. You received the exact same amount, the exact same measure, the exact same Holy Spirit, the exact same measure, the exact same explosive power, the exact same power that made, you, made Jesus like a one-man army, makes you like a one-man army. That's why Jesus said, I don't expect that you can be contained. You cannot be connected. And the, nothing that the world can offer and do is going to limit you and keep you back if you begin to, and begin to realize uh, what you possess and who you possess. Glory to God. Oh, pastor, pastor, I know we have power. One of us can put 1,000 to flight and two of us can put 10,000 to flight. Isn't that right, pastor? 
No. That is not right. I know it sounds spiritual. I know you're impressed when you heard that. But where is that at? It's in the Old Testament. We're New Testament believers. One. One man with life. One man standing on the word. And one man standing on the word and relying on the power of the Holy Ghost put all of hell to flight. At the resurrection, Jesus spoiled all principalities and powers and might and dominion in every name that's named. He, oh, he spoiled all of them, every demon, you know, every principality and power. Oh, the prince of Persia, the prince of Grisha, those princes, those, those demons in the atmosphere that, that, that withstood in the days of Daniel when Daniel was praying and the angel appeared and said, Gabriel appeared and said, the very first day that you, that you prayed, God sent me, but I couldn't get through. I couldn't fight through that atmosphere. Michael had to help me. Those are the same ones that withstood Jesus and they, they arrayed themselves against Jesus on that resurrection morning when he was coming up out of that pit. They all arrayed him. Grisha, Persia, Thyra, all of them. And the Bible says, we have a high priest that has passed through the heavens. Jesus passed right through. He's the, he's the resurrected one. Amen. That one man one man with resurrection life, one man with life in him, the life of God, one man relying on the Holy Ghost and standing on the word of God conquered all of hell. Amen? Amen. And guess what? You're made just like him. As he is, so are we. When we get to heaven, no. In this world, as he is, so are we. Jesus said, that's why, no, 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 no. You're limitless just like me. Nothing that can limit you. Nothing the devil through darkness and the curse and the, through, uh, can, uh, can do to keep you back or hold you back. It cannot happen when you're aware of the life that's in you and walk in it. Number two, you're aware, you walk in the word. Walk in the word. Walk in the, the word will set you free. Keep on, keep on after it with the word. Keep on hitting it with the word. Hit the, but I haven't seen the results, Pastor. Keep on hitting it with the word. That's what Jesus did in the, in the pit of hell when he was there for one day. He was hitting it with the word. Standing on the promise. You will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will I suffer the whole. He's hitting it with day two. You will not leave my soul in hell. Day three. You will not leave. How? And up he comes out of that place. Glorified, amen? And that's the same with you. You keep hitting it with the word of God, amen? You'll come up and out just like Jesus. Amen. And it's the Holy Ghost that will do it. Glory to God. Let's stop right there. We thank you that you've given us everything. You have every expectation that we will live a limitless life in this earth because you have provided everything that you have, everything that you had to live it yourself. You've given us your word. Thank you, Jesus. You've given us the Holy Ghost, and you've given us the life. Help us to realize these things, to walk in them, and to glorify you, and to just, Lord, to be the light. We're the light of the world. We are the singular light, just like you were. That's our assignment now. Wherever we go, we're the answer because Jesus lives in us. That life is in us. Help us to walk this way and glorify you. In Jesus' name, all the saints said, amen.